Happy Monday, everybody. It's time for another edition of Ask Mike. Courtney Mims alongside Mike Irwin here. And Mike, before we get started today, I do want to make a note. We did get a ton of questions this week. It was a bye week, and you guys had plenty of questions for us. David Porter, G.A. Hogg both asked questions. We couldn't get them in the show this week. We're going to try and get them in the show. We also had a call this week from a viewer. They didn't leave me their name, but they were asking about the alma mater not being played before games. Well, guess what? You have it asked Mike viewers know we've already answered that question. We had another question about that three weeks ago. If you want to see the answer to that, we're not going to answer it in this one, but it is in the Ask Mike defending tail and green. Mr. Freeze gets ripped and where are the hogs tight ends? That is the episode it's in. Watch that episode. You can see that on our website. Okay. Let's get into it, shall we? Don't forget to like and subscribe on this video and give us a comment as well. That helps us in the YouTube algorithms. Okay, our first question is from the Hawk Hawkins, who wants to know, do we know any more about Green than we did last week? Will we have to play LSU without him? And if so, do we have a chance? Uh, Sam Pittman in his Monday press conference uh, kind of did what I thought he would do. He's not going to definitively say anything, but here's the key thing. He worked out last week. And they even, even though it was an open date week, so that I think two of those practices were kind of just walkthroughs. The one, I think maybe Thursday or Friday, was full, full, a full-scale workout. So he went through that. The fact that he did that last week, it looks pretty good to me. Uh, however, I do think Razorback fans need to consider the possibility that because of that injury, he could get re-injured at some point in the game or it could stiffen up on him or anything. So I think there is at least a likelihood you have to consider that Malachi Singleton would have to come in the game like he did against Tennessee. And the good news is he's already done that. I think he'll be in a better situation having done what he did against Tennessee than if it was just cold and happening this week. So that's pretty good news. Patrick Kudis is back. Now this is a, an offensive guard that has been out since preseason. He, he went to one or two preseason practices, and he had a back injury, and we haven't seen him since. Yeah. Well, he, he came back last week and worked out. Looks like he's going to be available to play this week. And there was some speculation, and you could tell it by the question that was being asked, asked in the press conference, that maybe you've got that problem over there with Blackstock at, at right tackle, and maybe Kudus would be somebody you would stick over there. And Sam Pittman said, well, it's always a possibility that we move people around. But stop and think about this. Guy hasn't practiced even, except last week, going all the way back into the preseason. He's not played in any games, and you're going to put him in a game and put him in a new position. So I don't think that will happen. Um, they still are missing uh, an offensive uh, a, a, a cornerback, I think, in the yeah, second. Yeah, Jalen Braxton. Braxton. Yeah. That's not good. I was hoping they'd get him back. And Rodney Hill is still out as a running back. But Sam Pittman did say that uh, Braylon Russell will continue to play more and more. And why not after what he did on that winning drive against Tennessee? So, And it's been noted that he's also a better pass blocker than Jaquindon Jackson. So I think we're going to see him in this game. I don't think this, it's a bad problem to have. This is, is what I'm you're saying. going to be going up against the number one team in the SEC in sacks, and it's important that whoever's back there needs to be able to block. Absolutely. So I don't think that I think Braylon playing is, is a very good situation uh, for Arkansas. For everybody, if he has to. If he has to. Oh, not Bray. Bra I thought you were referring to Singleton. Y yes. Good, yeah, Braylon Russell getting, getting yeah, playing Braylon time. Yeah, Braylon Russell getting more playing time is good. Yes, absolutely. And for everybody worried about Taylor Green, I said this last week. I mean, him jumping up and down on the field with fans huh. after that win, I do not think they would have allowed him to celebrate right. the win like he did if he was the seriously, other thing is seriously he, injured. He didn't sit out. What if he'd sat out the whole week just to rehab? We all remember what happened in 2022 when K.J. Jefferson played but had to sit out all week and didn't practice. He wasn't ready. And now Arkansas lost that game. I can't remember. I'm trying to remember the game now. Uh, Might have been the Liberty game. One of those games, uh, he sat out all week, did pray, but, but he wasn't prepared. So uh, Green didn't even have to sit out. 
Yeah, and I think you, you will see more when that injury report comes out because I really love that they do that in the SEC now where you get to kind of have an idea right. of who is at least probable and questionable and then out for this game. So uh, we'll see. We'll have more information on him uh, as we go through the week. KY Hogg asks, can we beat LSU? At first I thought Ole Miss was way better, but keeping the LSU game close by making too many mistakes. But by the time it was over, I kept thinking – LSD was better and also better than Tennessee. I mean, I would agree with that assessment. I, I certainly thought Ole Miss would win the game. I thought they looked better for most of the game. But by the end of the game, I was sitting there thinking, this is, this, we, we've been sleeping on LSU. Oh, I wasn't? Who said LSU was going to win that game last week? Well, okay, I but, but what I'm saying is when you get into a discussion about the best teams in the end, I don't, nobody agrees on anything. Tennessee might be back in the discussion in a week or two. We don't know. Uh, everybody's forgetting about A&M. They're in a really good position. So LSU, to me, the best thing you can hope. Now, one thing about Arkansas and LSU is that LSU is more passing. They don't run the ball a whole lot. They run a lot of empty sets. And uh, Travis Williams has got a good situation with these hybrid safety linebacker types where he can go with different fronts and try to kind of guess, are they going to throw the ball here? I mean, you're going with an empty set, you're pretty sure they're going to throw the ball. So he can adjust. So I think Arkansas's defense, what worked against Tennessee, I think will probably work against uh, LSU. It's a similar type situation. Yeah, and mixing up those fronts and keeping them on their toes right. a little bit. Although you have to think that LSU has watched that tape a little maybe. bit and are maybe preparing for to see a, a couple of different fronts and to see them mixing it up. We'll have to see what happens in this game. But Mike, I did say LSU would win. I did okay. say that. I mean, I was also uh, high on Vanderbilt this year as well, too. So I'm not going to toot my own horn there, but there you go. Mousetown says, I know the Hogs need a week off, but I'm worried that it will kill all the momentum from that win over Tennessee. Plus, they saw how much trouble the Vols had with Florida. They have to be asking if the Volunteers are really just overrated. Leave it to Mousetown to be a worry wart. And of course, you want this uh, open date this week. It was perfect, yeah. perfect timing. Um, there's always a chance when you have a big win and you sit out a week, you might lose momentum. But you, you just can't think that way. There's no way to know. I think the main thing is, again, you had that extra week for Taylor Green to just kind of, you know, he's still working out, but he's, he's, not, he's not out there being exposed in a game this weekend. And then as far as what happened to Tennessee, what he's doing is sleeping on Florida. Florida's, Florida's <laughs> okay. another. No, Florida's another one of these teams like Vanderbilt that everybody wrote off I mean, they're going to fire Billy Napier, and then they're not firing Billy Napier. Now, they might at the end of the year. Well, that's but, jury's but still getting, out on that. We'll but they're out. getting better. And I'm telling you, if you watch that game, it wasn't just Tennessee being a bunch of goobers. It was Florida playing a really good game. Well, and we have to go back, and you said it. I think DJ Williams said it. I think some other people on our team said it. That Tennessee, they were not high on Tennessee going into the game with Arkansas because they were like, who has Tennessee played? Who has Tennessee really faced? And so now you're seeing Tennessee go up against uh, SEC teams and SEC talent, and you're kind of seeing some of the things that maybe didn't show up in we're those just, first four we're games. We're just now starting to realize what – the transfer portal and NIL has done to the SEC. Yeah. It is no longer a league where you've got three or four teams at the top that dominate so they get into the playoffs and they'll probably one of them will probably win it. I don't it's that's not true anymore. Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you who's going to be in, in in the SEC championship game. I don't know. It changes every week. I just know that there are a lot of good teams in the league and it's more balanced than I've ever seen it. Well, and again, that's thanks to if, you, if you're a person that hates the transfer portal and NIL, what it is doing is balancing some teams out well, right now. The transfer portal, I think, still needs work, but the NIL is not the disaster I thought it would be because you can't, can only get, give money to so many players and you can't stockpile anymore. Mm -hmm. You go after the best, but you're losing some. If you're a Tennessee or an Alabama or a Georgia or a Texas, you're losing some guys you used to be able to stockpile. Well, right, and that's why it's important for teams to have money to spend on these players. That is why it is important that you that you continue, like Hunter Yurchek, right, where everyone was like, oh, 
$500,000 he wants to raise for the for slobbering hog, yeah, he sees an opportunity to uh, get money there. True. And that is really important in this day and age. We could go on and on about that. But the bionic pig says, immediately following Ole Miss's loss to LSU, many in their fan base were calling for Kiffin's head. Were college football fans this polarizing in the 70s and 80s? Well, first of all, on the internet, there's always going to be people doing stupid stuff like that. I guarantee you Kiffin is not, not in trouble at Ole Miss, but yes, you have crazy stuff. No, it wasn't like that. And the reason it wasn't like that, it's not that those fans weren't there. They were just sitting in their houses saying stuff like that, talking <laughs> to the wall. They were screaming at their... Uh, yeah, they were just yeah. talking to their TV. Uh, because the only way in those days that you sort of expressed your opinion... And, Boy, I'm dating myself here. Oh, no. They used to have in the newspapers the, the letters to the editor. Do you remember yes, those? I, yes. And so they would have three or four in the Arkansas, the old Arkansas Gazette. They'd have three or four of these things. And every once in a while you'd get some crackpot fan, but they'd put it in there and you'd laugh and talk about how stupid the guy was. Uh, and we also, they used to call them MOS's, man on the street. TV stations yeah, yeah. would go out sometimes and interview people when they were coming out of a game, you know, just to get their opinions yeah. about things or go down on Dixon Street and just talk to a bunch of people. And you could get some really dopey opinions that way. But it wasn't the volume that you have now. Again, what used to be a bunch of people in their houses just yelling at the wall, now they can get on there and people are looking at them and they don't mind it that they look completely ignorant. They just don't care. No, you know? they don't. I don't mind being stupid, you know? Well, it's but a, they hide behind. See, you if you went on and did a man on the street, right? That's a camera in your face with your name showing right. up on the screen. Well, same same with the letters to the editor. I was looking I mean, at one of, my, the, one of my friends on Facebook because I've told you before, I just read this stuff to see what their friends say. And they were talking about this exhibition baseball game against Oklahoma State on Friday in which Arkansas just dominated. They won eight to one. They, I think they, it was seven pitchers combined yeah. for a one hitter and Arkansas had like 13 hits and this guy was talking about the same old story. Arkansas is striking out all the time. This is just pitiful. And I'm thinking, you know what? And, and to, to their credit, everyone else was going, it does not, not ever bother you to get in front of people and show how stupid you are. I mean, to oh complain goodness. about something like that, come on. But it's out there, you know. Oh, yeah. And it's always been that way, I promise you. It's just they didn't have the outlet. And they don't have a, uh, something to hide behind, too, right? Because that's what I'm saying. There are people that well, they create they usernames. They don't want to hide behind it. They have no problem looking like goobers. Some some people do. Some people don't have the same username or the same profile well, picture. Well, maybe, but you know? I'm just saying... They get into it with their friends and don't seem to have their friends by what is wrong with you. Yeah, I, I definitely the people who are bold enough to put their real name and their real profile picture, I go, wow, dang, that's crazy. Uh, Jared says, I've heard that T will change up the defense on that last Tennessee, uh, on that last drive that Tennessee had. If that is correct, what did he change up, Mike? Well, we can't know that for sure because he doesn't do press conferences. You know? <laughs> we wish, please. You can't go talk to him after the game. I think that question came from the fact that uh, I think Heupel talked about it after the game. They they showed gave some looks that they hadn't seen before. Yeah. I, I don't know so much. It was something he did different in the last drive. I think he was doing that the whole, whole game. Whole game. Yes. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's what their players I mean, said too. They went. They normally do a four-man front. They didn't do a lot of that. They did it at times, but they had a three-two-six, a three-three-five, and it's because they have these hybrid linebacker safeties. And they can load up in the secondary if they think you're going to throw the ball. If they think you're going to run, you can bring them down. They're more linebackers. And so, again, as I said earlier, that what, what, what strategy you would use against Tennessee, you would do the same thing against LSU. Right, but they are watching the tape, too, and that's the point. But the mixing of fronts is what even Pittman credited him with. Is yeah, that they I were think just that's keeping what, them. I don't think it was necessarily anything special on that drive. It was they were doing that the whole game. Right, and I think one of Tennessee's players, why this also kept going was because he was like, well, they were doing something in that game, the whole game that we hadn't seen. They were running like a 3-3 a three, three star defense, and he was like, this yeah. is this was kind of crazy. We, we, we just weren't prepared as, as we should have for, been for it. Um, H.L. McCamish wants to know, are you surprised that Malzahn benched K.J.? I wasn't. He found out what we already knew. KJ is not the same player he was before he got all that NIL money. 
Yeah, a lot of fans are ragging on him. I feel really bad about this situation because Wh wh what? I do. I, I, look, I'm not defending him, but I feel bad about the fact that NIL did this to him. What are okay. you? Yeah, I'm just surprised you feel bad. I'm sorry. I'm no, just shocked. No, I mean, look, this guy really helped Arkansas at a time when they needed help. The yeah. tw 2021, 20, 2021 season was an amazing turnaround. And if he hadn't gotten hurt in 2022, it would have been the same thing. But you get this NIL money, and it just changed everything last year. And it looks like to me now, I think what happened to him, and you think about this, you've got your guy, your offensive coordinator that's always been your guy. He's, he's your quarterback's coach, Kendall Bryles. And he's always been your guy. And then all of a sudden, poof, he's gone. You get this guy, and he's different, and you don't want to, and you're mad. But you're getting this money, so you go, well, at least I'm getting some money. And then at the end of the year, you're just, everybody's mad at you, so you go to another school. By that time, mentally, all you're thinking is, okay, I'm probably not going to the NFL now like I hoped I would. So I'll just make as much money as I can these last two years, and then I'll go about my life afterward. And what it does is you're, all of a sudden you find you're not even a starter anymore. So I don't know how that affects your NIL. I'm, I don't know how those deals work. I, I mean, know. well, every deal is different, right? And and we this is something I wish as well is that NIL deals were more public so that we would be able to see like the contract and we would be able to see exactly what was in it and exactly what terms and agreements. But again, it's all behind closed doors and a lot of that stuff is in private. We don't even know how much money he's actually making. That's he could right. be making a lot more than we estimated. I, and I'll say this too, Mike. I really did like KJ. I really did. I liked his family. I got to go and visit with them and do those KJ Chronicles um, last football right. season. And so I really, I did enjoy getting to know him and his family and how he was raised and all of those things. I do think it's a case where, you know, you, you get a little excited, I think, when all this money appears. You and know? it may you not get just be the money. It may just have just been the combination of you took my, my, my coach away from me. Okay. One way or another, because I, I was always told that Pittman didn't, he pretty much told Kendall Bryles when that second job was made public, he didn't want that out there anymore. Okay. He told him after the, after the whole Mississippi State thing, are you going to Mississippi? He said, okay, I'm not going, Coach. Okay, but don't do this again. Yeah. If, you, if this gets public, you're going to have to go. Yeah, because he put out, remember, do you remember his tweet he put out with KJ, that picture of them, yeah. where he said, you know, Right. Oh, I mean, you know, what and, he said and, something. And to be fair to Kendall Bryles, I think his agent did it. I think he stabbed him in the back. And th so he didn't have a choice. But still, K.J. probably knew that yeah. and knew that, his, his, that Pittman basically said, you got to go now, okay. and I'm giving you this guy. Sure. And he's mad, and then it's not working. And so, well, at least I got my money. You know, yeah. and then it changes your whole thinking. Yeah, and the other thing, too, is he probably maybe wasn't so annoyed when Dan, you know, got to Arkansas, but maybe working with him, mm -hmm. it just, it never felt like it really was a well, good combo. Well, it didn't work, and it was obvious yeah. from the beginning that offense that it wasn't working. Oh, no, and and we know this from, from people who, who have kind of spoken to us off the record about it, that... His offense was incredibly complicated, and it was, and, and there were players that really were going, "What are you doing?" And when you inherit a situation like he did, where your quarterback has done a certain thing a certain mm -hmm. way, you're going to go in there and tell him to be somebody, somebody <laughs> totally yeah, different. Yeah, change it, change everything. I mean, that wasn't smart. No, no, it wasn't, and, and obviously that's why it didn't work out, right? So, yeah. and we know that story. We've seen that story. Hog Talica asked if you could re rewrite. Razorback sports history by changing the outcome of one of two games. Which one would it be? The 2006 loss to Florida in the SEC football championship game or the 1995 basketball loss to UCLA in the men's basketball tournament finals. Keep in mind that only six programs have ever won the SEC football championship game. I know my answer quickly. Well, that's a, I know tough, my answer. that's a toughie because of the implications of what happened as a result of those two things. In other words, what would you change with the Arkansas football team if they won that game, the SEC tour? And what would change with basketball if they had won back-to-back -back national championships? I'll go with the national championship because it's a bigger deal. It's a national championship. Yeah. It's a national championship. But let me explain. Okay, here's what I really think Nolan's – it wasn't his fault, but things just started to come unravel after that. And how they lost that was weird because they were prepared for everything – UCLA typically did. 
they just had this goober player that hadn't done squat, and they weren't paying attention to him, and he comes in and, and is a leading scorer, and they lose because of this guy who never played like that before yeah. or after that. So it was kind of a strange thing. But through a weird set of circumstances that I'm not going to get into because it was too complicated, everything just kind of started slowly going downhill. What I'm saying is they win back-to-back -back national championship. I think Nolan's recruiting is better. All these yappers that were mad at him yeah. would, would stop yapping. They wouldn't have anything to yap about. And I really think that terrible period of time when you had Stan Heath and then you had John Pelfrey and then you had Mike Anderson and you went through this long period where Arkansas basketball wasn't Arkansas basketball, I'm not sure that would have happened. I think oh. Nolan would have coached years beyond that. I think he had 10 years left in him. I, I, pr I would probably say you're right on that. And, and also, again, I mean, I get that Hogtalica says, keep in mind that only six programs have ever won the SEC football championship game. I get that. That's a big deal, too. But we're, we're comparing a SEC championship to a national championship, a national championship. And that does wonders for your, like you said, recruiting your program for years I to think, come. I think there's an outside chance that if they had won that SEC championship game, they might have gotten into the championship game. I don't know that okay. they would have, what? but you might have won one, and that would have made a huge not, difference in the football program. But that you're right. You're totally that's right. That's why it's a tough but one to whoa, answer. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're talking about being able to say, here you go, if you rewrite history, rewrite history, you get the national championship, you get back-to-back -back right. national championships. And the other one you might get The it. other one you might get it. I know which one I would take. I'm I know, a and I'm <laughs> I agree with you, but I'm just saying it's a tougher decision than you think. Okay, all right, I guess. I mean, I'm taking the national title. And back-to-back, -back, I mean, that's huge. Back-to-back -back national champions. Yeah. I mean, there's not many programs that have done that, too, so just saying that. All right, Razor Alex 88 says, can we please do something about those fossil lights at uh, Razorback Stadium that have been there since the dinosaurs and install some LED lights? I don't know if they've been there since the dinosaurs. <laughs> A lot of schools have those. Somebody told me about 40% of SEC schools. They're very expensive, half million dollars at least, maybe more than that. Uh, the answer I got in poking around over there and finding out is it going to happen anytime soon was, no, it's not going to happen anytime soon. Our main focus right now, NIL. We've yeah. got to get that money up. And then there are some other projects. Uh, I think they're anticipating this revenue sharing thing coming through. That's a whole different ball game. If you're suddenly going to have to take a chunk of your athletic department budget and start giving it to athletes, then you have to, you can't just p play fast and loose with the money you have. So, and then I think there's some other projects, even with some other sports that they have promised. Okay, we're going to, you know, there's supposedly a new softball I, I, facility, yes. a workout facility, or whatever you but call it. But is that being pushed back now because of NIL stuff? I don't NIL know, stuff. but uh, we were hearing they were going to get a new soccer uh, locker room mm -hmm. uh, operation center and, and a new thing for softball, and it hasn't happened yet. So there's some, and then Dave Van Horn said, Sooner or later, they're going to upper deck the, the home, you oh, know, yeah. behind home yeah. plate. And so they're, they want that. Okay. So everybody wants their facilities, and uh, you might have to do without your LED lights for a while. I think LED lights in the, in the hierarchy of things, I think the LED lights are a little bit lower on my list. But I understand what Razor Alex 88 is saying. I just think this goes into a larger thing. We just talked about the good of NIL, right? What has NIL done for uh, the fo uh, football teams in the SEC? But there, there's the bad, right, for those smaller sports that now probably are being put on the back burner, guys, yeah, because, on some of the things of NIL. because of NIL. Vogel Park needs to be updated. It does. I mean, yeah, it needs to be right. updated. Absolutely. Uh, so I just, when is it going to be done? And well, soccer. I mean, and soccer, soccer is one of the best women's programs out there. Yeah. I mean, they're good every year, and they their facility's okay, but it needs to be it, better. It needs to be better, exactly. And Hogs We Trust says Ole Miss came out with a statement on faking injuries. I found it interesting that they felt compelled to do so. What do you think can be done to stop injury faking, yeah, if anything? We got this question a couple of weeks ago, and I kind of didn't have an answer. I just said, oh, oh geez, you can't, really, you can't really punish somebody. It, it's sort of like a... What do you call that when you, it's a judgment call. Yeah, we're, yes. So that looked pretty stupid. That guy was fine, and then he just hit the ground. Okay, that's a penalty. You still can't prove it, and that's the problem. So here's a way to deal with that. I, I really thought about this a lot. I call it 
A player safety rule. A, a player safety, safety rule. rule. Okay. This is how you solve the problem. There we go. You say, you put a rule that says, if you go down on the field, if you're injured to the point where you're down on the field and you're having to be attended to, so it stops the clock while they deal with you, you must be seriously enough injured that when you come off the field, you not only need to be examined, right. but you need to be observed for a certain period of time okay. to make sure you're okay to go to back, go back in. in the game. Because you right. don't want to send somebody back in, and they shouldn't have been back in. Sure. So that takes time. So the new rule would be, if you have to be brought off the field like that where there's been a stoppage of play, you can't come back into the game until the next possession. Okay. In other words, if we, you're on defense and the other yeah. team's on offense, they're going to have to, you know, they're going to have to punt it to your offense or do whatever, kick a score a touchdown, whatever yeah, happens. Yeah, whatever. And then your defense comes back on the field later. Then you can come back in. I promise you, mm. if a team is on a drive where you're faking an injury so your guys can get recovered, yeah. they're not going to want to do that where you're not even in the game well, anymore. Well, especially if it's a key player, am I that's right? right. So, that's what I'm saying. So I think that would stop it. I think that's a great idea. I think that's a really good idea. I wonder Just why. Just call it a player safety rule. A player safety rule. And then, you know, people or the, the you know, SEC and NCAA would get behind that because that's giving, you know, that's making yeah, sure the athletes are okay. politically correct. I like that, Mike. That. Is everyone listening here from the NCAA? What we got? We, we got some <laughs> player viewers. Safety. Player safety rule. Mike Irwin right there. Hog Redneck wants to know, when are people going to get it about Vanderbilt? Hold on, Hog Redneck. I get it about Vanderbilt. What are you talking about? He hasn't been watching the show, clearly. Uh, this is no fluke. Beat a pretty good Kentucky team on the road. They are for real glad we don't play them. I Man. Yeah, some people are now saying, okay, the game is up now because they're looking at their schedule and who they're fixing to play. They got to go to Texas. They're, they have a tough schedule. They have a tough schedule. But this is what I said yesterday on, on our Pig no. Trail Nation show. I said, these guys, if you look at their stats, their, their, their stats, just their stats. Yeah, yeah. They're bottom half of the SEC they are. and everything. They're not, they don't have great offensive stats. They don't have great defensive stats. They just don't give up. You, you think you're going to get them, and then they just come back. They don't quit. I said, what they remind me of is that stupid guy on TV, that commercial where he's mayhem. What's his name? Oh, the car commercial. Yeah, where the mayhem he gets in, guy. He's like, is he progressive or yeah, all state? Well, I don't know all what state, it is, maybe? but he's mayhem. He's mayhem. He just yeah. tears everything up. When you, when you think you're fine and you're just cruising along and boom. And boom, mayhem happens. So yeah. Vanderbilt is mayhem. They're just, <laughs> they're just causing mayhem for everybody they play. I, and listen. look. They are tied for fifth with a, with four other teams. If they had beaten and they came within one, two points, they should if they have had beat beaten in Missouri. Missouri, they would be in third place in the SEC right now. I And listen, I'm telling you, if you watch that first game that they played, you would feel differently. I know a lot of people weren't keeping eyes on Vanderbilt, but if you watch them, I know, I know they lost to what Georgia State. I know that was they, the weird. The, when that, that was happened, a fluke, I went, right? yeah, same old Vanderbilt. And then all of a sudden, it's just like they turn into somebody else. But if you watch those, if you watch their first couple of games, you would have been like, huh, maybe this team has something. Maybe this team is different <laughs> this year. I don't know. I just, I was like, don't sleep on Vanderbilt and. People I mean, were still they didn't sleeping, have so. this big letdown after beating Alabama. I mean, Kentucky's pretty good, and that was no, at Kentucky. And, and Kentucky fans, if you saw on social media, they go, ah, Vanderbilt, that was a fluke. Alabama's not that great, blah, blah, blah. You know, they were, they were doing everything they could to downplay this well, game. Well, now they see what happened. Don't do that. Don't overlook your opponents. Mayhem. Right? Mayhem, exactly. Eddie Lynn asks, with no football game, were you at the baseball games over the weekend? Arkansas won two of three from the Okies. What did you think, Mike? I had to write this down because oh, I, oh, I, had to, oh. I had to keep notes here. Yeah, well, there's a lot to talk there was, about. There were three games. There was a Friday regular nine-inning game, and Arkansas just dominated that game. They uh, <laughs> DVHU seven pitchers. They one hit them with 18 strikeouts. That means you got seven really good pitchers <laughs> at least. Uh, OSU did score one unearned run, but Arkansas had 13 hits and won easily eight to one. That's the one where the guy on Facebook was complaining yeah. because he said so, Arkansas struck out too many times or whatever. And not many home, not many home runs. Not right? a lot. Just they just driving runs in. Yeah. Okay. Then I went to the first of the two five inning games on Saturday. Oh, I was okay. bad luck. Because that's the one they lost. 
And the pitchers in that game were Ben Bybee, who struggled last year. We remember that. And Will McIntyre, who struggled at the end of last year. We remember that. And they got a true freshman, Tate McGuire. Those three guys gave up a total of four home runs. Yeah. I think Bybee gave up two, and the other two had one each. And so it was a 6-3 to three game. Those home runs decided everything. Mm. So Arkansas loses that game, and they did have their regular line, hitting lineup in. They, they, did, they weren't bad. It was five innings, three runs in five innings, but they could have been better. Okay, then you come back with game three, which is another five-inning game, and now DVH changes his whole lineup up. These are all backup, backup catcher, backup shortstop, first baseman, all that stuff. They did have uh, Parker Coyle started and went yes, to two yeah. innings. So he's, he's the one returning veteran pitcher. But other than that, it was pitchers that I haven't heard of but apparently are new and pretty good. Okay, what did they do? Pitching, same thing, only one, un, one earned, unearned run. So those guys were good on the mound, and then <laughs> these backup guys scored seven runs. Tyler Holland. Yes. You're not going to hear much about this guy this year. Why? Because he – Play, plays behind with Evo Lloyd. Yeah, yeah. He's a shortstop. <laughs> but he hit a three-run homer, and he Ooh. was a home run hitter in high school. So this is your depth that, the, that mm -hmm. you know, if anybody gets hurt, if you lose a first baseman, third baseman, right fielder, left fielder, whatever, you got depth on this yeah. team. So I, if you're excited about Razorback baseball, you should be. But here, what's the best part of what happened? I, I would thought you were going to talk about not a lot of home runs. I no, thought you were going to talk about that. The best part of that whole thing on Friday was the crowd. Oh, absolutely. You, this isn't a deal where everybody's in town for a football game. Yeah. There was no game. No. This was just Northwest Arkansas people coming out to watch the Razorbacks. 8,000 people at I, that I, game. I had a friend text me, no joke. They said, uh... Is Arkansas baseball? What what event are they hosting tonight? What is Arkansas? They thought a like a, a different team had come and 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 done something there. And I go, no no no, this is just an exhibition game yeah. between Oklahoma State. They said, no way. Eight thousand no people, way. and it's all mostly Northwest Arkansas people. You didn't have the, all these people coming in for a football no. game. I, I mean, it's incredible. I seriously thought you were going to bring up the home runs because that was what Dave Van Horn said was like. Yeah, we're not, you know, we weren't swinging for the fences. And that's right. what you we, you and I talked about that a sure. few weeks ago where they, they were hitting a lot of home runs in fall ball. And you went, what are, what are they doing? I thought they had so changed would give, their philosophy. So that would give back baseball fans something to be excited about for the next three months. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, we have a lot to be excited about because uh, basketball season Coming is up. right around the corner. The Razorbacks ranked 16th. In the preseason poll, and we have some questions about that slobbering hog that's yeah. on the court. Slobbering hog is back, Ham Porter says, and the masses rejoice. Now, can Cal and the athletic department fix the blue shark outfits a lot of students wear for the big games? I don't have a problem with the sharks themselves, but wearing blue is ridiculous. You would never see Kentucky students wearing red. Surely there is a solution that can be found on this, right? Or am I just an old fogey who needs to let it go? No, I'm an old fogey. I agree with you. Now, I don't believe you want to stop the students from wearing the shark thing. Hey, it's shark they and saw. They call it shark and saw. Shark and, and saw. It's okay. Yeah. Even though it's a little bit like Ole Miss, it's not the same thing. So, But we came up with a solution. We did. We did. I looked it up. you go on the Internet yep. and you find da 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 Red and white shark outfits. There so you all go. we got to do is get the athletic department <laughs> to buy them some and get rid of those ugly blue ones. Or we and it's not Kentucky blue, it's North Carolina blue. It is North Carolina blue. It's that Tar Heel blue. But I think we're right. I think we just need to get them to buy the red shark outfits. We get them all wearing shark red and then beautiful. We can do shark and saw. Yep. So I think there is a solution, Ham Porter, and that is your solution. So uh, Armand Abbey asks, is there anything more annoying? than Kentucky basketball fans. I don't think there is, Armand. I saw a nice story on the internet about Cal having his players pass out socks and sneakers to needy kids, even washing the kids' feet like they did in the Bible. But here came the Kentucky fans dumping all over the story with their stupid Cal is a loser comments. You know, I, when all of this mm. first, first started happening after he took the job, I thought, okay, they'll vent for a while and they'll go away. They just don't go away. And it was totally inappropriate because this is a story that's got nothing to do with really about basketball. It's just going out into the central part of the state, 
finding uh, through a, a private organization that's yeah, that, that Samaritan's did, Feet, right? Yeah, did it at Kentucky, so they're doing it here. Mm -hmm. And you're passing out sneakers, is what yeah. it looked like yeah. to me, and socks, and 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 yet you're involving your players because you're having them wash the feet of these kids. Yeah. And then Cal himself did it. I know. He was it's, doing it. And he did it at Kentucky, too. He yeah, did. So he, you're yeah. thinking, this is really nice. And then all of a sudden, you get the comments uh, about the story that's posted. And they're not talking about that. They're talking about, oh, wait till you find out he's going to leave all of his players at home because he doesn't play his best players. Because apparently, they've got four or five guys that are kind of banged up right now. And he didn't have them participate in the, in the practices. Right. Because he said, look, I'm going to save them for when the season starts. Right, for when it's actually important and they have games. And they turned it into, yeah, that's what he always does. He leaves guys on the bench, puts the best players on the bench, and has his terrible players out there. So we have to hear that again. Um, we're going to exchange Kentucky basketball oh, fan oh. stories. Here's what I would say, first of all. Can Alabama football in the SEC is what Kentucky basketball is in the SEC. Both of those programs have dominated their sport in, off and on, but pretty consistently over the decades. So their fans are, you know, we're good, and, and, and they're proud. Okay, I get that. I've been around a lot of Alabama football fans. I've been to Tuscaloosa many times. I've been to Bryant-Denny Stadium. I've never felt like they were tough people to be around, jerks. I've never had any of them treat us badly. We used to go live out there all the time. Well, I guess we still do. I don't do that anymore, but I've been out there live next to their stadium many times. They would come by. They didn't act like bozos. They explained stuff. I remember talking to a guy one time because they got all these statues of all these coaches up, bronze statues. I think Arkansas needs to do that, by the I, way. I like that, That'll yeah. They'll lead to the stadium. And they've got all these guys, and then there's Bear Bryant, and then they had Nick Saban. But Saban was wearing Nikes, bronze Nikes. And the guy pointed that out to me. He said, is that not cool? He's wearing bronze Nikes. Oh, my gosh, that's awesome. Yeah. So they're nice. They're nice yeah, people. Yeah. I even remember getting into a discussion about this. One guy said, yeah, but on the other side of the stadium, you got that graveyard. How can you have a stadium with a graveyard <laughs> right on one side I of it? I knew you were going to bring that and up. And he was like, well, they did that before. Uh, blah, blah. So it was pretty funny. <laughs> on the other hand, Kentucky basketball fans, if you've ever been to the SEC tournament, I, Especially I, if it's in Nashville because it's closer to Kentucky. Oh my goodness, they're everywhere driving you bananas with this and that and yeah, 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 yeah. and all this stuff, and they just don't won't go away. They they just they they'll walk up and get in your live shots. They'll stand behind you and do crazy things, and they just are annoying. Now yeah. I'm not saying every single one of them are, no. but as a group, there's something wrong with these people. I agree with you because I have an SEC basketball tournament story. My first year working with Pig Trail Nation, my second week on the job, I think it was my second week on the job, I went out to Tampa to the SEC men's basketball tournament in Tampa. And I was doing live shots just like every other reporter right outside the arena. And I was doing my live shots and getting along. And, you know, some fans, lovely. I even, I even chatted with some Texas A&M fans, some Tennessee fans. They were great. They were, we were having a great time. Um, Kentucky fans were the worst. I would, was just doing my live shot, not even bothering anybody, not even doing anything. And I had them come up, and they were loud and obnoxious and were grabbing, spilling beers on me, pushing me to the point where a security guard had to come over a Kentucky reporter had to come over and help me, and a Tennessee uh, reporter had to come over and help me. They were all like, we are so sorry. That is terrible. We're so sorry. I just was, I was shocked because I said, this is the worst, worst fan interaction I have ever had. I mean, they were touching me. Like, I've never had fans physically grab me and push me, and I was going, mm-mm. Mm -mm, I don't like you guys. And that was way before, right, the Coach Cal stuff happened. Yeah. And so then when all that happened, they're in my DMs. They're in my mentions. They're telling me I'm a crazy person. And I'm going, whoa, 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 whoa. Who are you? Where are you? I'm not messing with Kentucky. <laughs> so to make a long story short, yeah. it's no wonder that he left. Yeah. Are, are they, is anybody shocked that you would want to get away from that? No. I don't know if I would want to be there. I if think the fans he is act going like to that. find out that there is such a difference here. Yes. In the way that he goes about his, and the people that he comes into contact yeah. with, 
He's going to think it's oh, the best decision he ever made in I, his life. I have never, since I have been here, ever, ever, ever had a problem with any Razorback fans getting in my live shot, being annoying, being rowdy. I mean, they are, and even when they come up to me and they're excited, I go, hey guys, be careful, you know, no, you know, no curse words, no nothing, and they're super respectful yeah. about it. They're super respectful. So I have to shout out Razorback fans on that. Lanny wants to know, do you accept Kirby Smart's explanation that shoving Mississippi State's quarterback was unintentional and he doesn't remember much about it. I'm excited to hear what you have to say about this because I, I, I want to know what you have to say. part of what he's saying, but not all of what he's saying. Now let's talk okay. about what ha actually yeah. happened. You had a uh, Mississippi State's quarterback ran out of bounds and it's one of those things where he had momentum so he goes back toward the bench and, right. the, and the sidelines is packed. There's a lot of people there. A lot, yeah. Now, it looks like Kirby's mad because their defense is screwing up. So he runs over and he, he's coming sideways and it looks like he's trying to, he said later on he was trying to get a hold of the defensive coordinator, probably to yell at him and tell him he, you know, he better get his act together. <laughs> to the point where he took off his hat, he was all mad, he's running, not running, but moving fast and then this quarterback comes up to his right, yeah. this comes from off the side and they kind of bump and when they bump, Kirby Smart just goes like that and shoves him. He pushes him, yeah. Now, when he pushes him, he's not looking at him, but then he does turn and look at him. Here's where he went wrong, in my opinion. I think once he realized who he'd shoved, he should have stopped and said, hey, I'm sorry, yeah. just trying to talk to my guy over there and just pat him on the back yeah. and everything's fine. Yeah. But then he just, he just acted like, big deal, get out of my way. And he's mad and, and he's in the moment and all that. But then the, ex, the silly explanation that you don't remember it but you think but you, you you looked at him. You That's looked what, at him. I don't know how you can look at somebody and go, don't remember that. Yeah, like there's a guy with a uniform on there. <laughs> he's not not he's not wearing one of your red and yeah. and, and blue whatever they wear at, ten, at Georgia. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I accept part of it. The other part I don't. I think he should have said, look, heat of the moment. I was trying to make a point. It was kind of all happening. Yeah, I wish I had to stop and told him I was sorry. I wasn't intentionally pushing him. I just thought he thought he was somebody on the sidelines sure. on my staff in my way, and I wanted him to get out of the exactly. way. Exactly, which totally could be a realistic explanation of you thinking it was somebody on your staff. And and like, get, to get out through. of me. Coaches are always like, get back, get back, exactly, get out of Exactly, exactly. But then when you notice, that's when, I mean, you, you've got to take ownership of that. That's, yeah. that's what I think. You, you could have said it a thousand different ways, Kirby. Uh, and then our final question of the day is Marty Bird's proxy who asks, when you first arrived in Arkansas, was there one media member covering U of A sports during that era that you looked at and said, I want to do my job like that? Yeah, it, it turned, it didn't happen immediately, but it turned out to be Orville mm -hmm. uh, Henry. Yeah. When I got he here, it was right at the end of the 74, 75 sports year. I think baseball was just wrapping up. So all summer there's no sports. And I, that was good in my mind because I had all summer to try and learn what's going on as we approach football season the next fall. And so all I did was read newspapers. And there were newspapers out the wazoo. You had the Arkansas Gazette, and Orville worked for them. You had Northwest Arkansas Times. Grant Hall was the sports editor there. And I met Grant that during that period. And we're still friends to this day. Uh, there was a, a, sport, a newspaper in Springdale and one in Rogers. So I'm reading all this stuff every day. But one of the things I noticed about Orville, and it's such a contrast to now, Orville wasn't putting out a lot of opinions. I'm not going to say he didn't do it at all, but what he mostly did was he took a subject, whatever that subject was, and he broke it down. And he would basically break it down on what different people say about it. Now, as I, as I got into that year and got around other media people, a lot of them were complaining because they said Orville had access to Frank that other people didn't have. It's easy to be Orville. You just go ask Frank, and he gives you your story. That's what a lot of those people said. But the longer I was here, the more I began to realize that it wasn't Frank playing favorites. He would Frank uh, Frank would do that to anybody, and even to the point where what I began to realize is if I went over to the Broil Center every day right after lunch, I'd go anywhere I wanted. I'd go in coaches' offices if they weren't working or weren't busy. You had to look and see. But I could go into Frank's office, ask Donita, his secretary, because I see Frank. Yeah, it might be 10 minutes, or yeah, you can go in right now, whatever. He was always accessible. 
In other words, you didn't have to go to a press conference, and you could find out stuff that you were interested in that nobody else had. That's what any reporter wants. They want to scoop. They want to talk about something from the, somebody like Frank Broyles that nobody else has asked. And I was trying to do that on pretty much a daily basis. And then there were other people, assistant ADs, coaches downstairs in other sports. I remember a guy in the media, I'm not going to name him, he's not here anymore anyway, and we were talking one, one night, we were somewhere, at, I think at his apartment, and he was mad because he wanted to know something and it hadn't been able to get an answer. And I said, well, just call Frank. And he said, oh, I can't call him. I said, his number's in the phone book, call him. He goes, no, it's not. And I said, got it out and yeah. showed it to him. Call him. Well, he won't answer. Well, he not only answered, they talked for 10 or 15 minutes, and the guy got exactly what he wanted. So the point is, all I did was copy Orville. I figured out that Orville was just doing what the rest of us should have been doing. And it's this idea that you're not, now today it's different. Like this whole show is based on opinions. It but, is. It, but it wasn't so much back then. It was you're a reporter. You put all the information out there, and you let the public decide what they want to believe. And so that's who I pattern myself after. And, and Orville, the other thing, I, there was a lot of jealousy toward Orville. I remember one time I was in Barnhill, and they had this little tiny media room that you would work out of, and it was halftime, and they had some pizzas in there or whatever. And all these guys were griping about Orville this and Orville that. And I said, look, guys, you might as well come to, the, to a reality check here. When it comes to the Razorback media, there's all of us over here, and then there's Orville. And I said, Orville is greater than all of us put together because <laughs> he's developed a relationship with the fans where they trust him yeah. because he's put in the work. At that point, he'd been doing it for over 30 years. Yeah. And that, that's the other thing you figure out is you got to stay at it. You got to put in the work, and he did. He wasn't lazy. He didn't try to play off the fact that he was Orville Henry. He just put in the work. He went and he talked to people and came to once he moved up here, and he, I can't remember when he moved, but he finally, I think when he switched to the, the Arkansas Democrat, he moved up here. And when he was up here, he was at practice every day, just like everybody else. And it, it was fun talking to the guy. Yeah. You know, he was, he was fine. Yeah, well, he's an Arkansas media legend. I will, I will say one time, the funniest thing that ever happened, War Memorial Stadium, yeah. before a game, and it's, it's probably an hour before the game, and so there's people in the press box, but not much is going on. Well, a lot of these writers are writing other stories, so they use that time to write the story that it's not the game story, it may be another sport they're covering, whatever. So some of them are working, and other people are moving around. So there's this one guy, I won't mention him, but he was being very annoying and just asking a lot of people questions and talking very loud and blah, blah, blah. And he finally turned around and he looked at Orville, who was sitting down below working. He says, Orville, why don't you... And right when he said, why don't you, he said, why don't you shut up? <laughs> no. And that shut him up, and then everybody started clapping. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It was great. <laughs> that is a great story. Well, I was about to say, Mike, he's an Arkansas media legend, but hey, so are you. And that shows that you've kind of mimicked some of the things that he, not he Orville, did. Not Orville. There's not. Orville no, and I'm Paul Eels saying... are the two guys. Oh. Well, Mike Irwin's up there as well, okay? I, I, I know someone, you were, you were inducted into the Arkansas Sports Hall of Fame, don't lie. There's a lot of people in that. I know, but you are too, Mike. Give yourself some credit. That's why people watch this show. They like you as well. So that's going to do it for this week's Ask Mike. We'll see you next Monday to answer more of your questions.